Good morning. Good evening. Good all the things. Hey, what's going on? I am Katie Brannon, and this is going to be Tea Time Dark Time with Katie. I'm going to try a new series. It doesn't necessarily have to be about true crime, but it's going to be about dark matters that are not very well known. This one, though, we're starting out with a huge bang. I'm going to say trigger warning, okay? Absolutely trigger warning. I'm going to be talking about a prison riot that is not very well known. And this prison riot, it wasn't exactly the longest, uh, but it was the most bloodiest. And it the depravity of the human race has never been shown again. It was 36 hours of pure, absolute hell. That's an understatement. Now, I usually do shoot out, wow, shootouts. We're not even there. We're not even talking about that yet. My apologies. So this has really gotten my head. I want to do a shout out uh, to my friend, uh, Joseph Pesavento. Yes, that awesome horror writer. I met him during a convention and um, Arthur Con, and he's all, he does all kinds of cons and um, conventions. Oh, if you hear noise, Bowie is right here in front of me. Hi, honey. Hi, baby. Hi, honey. You're going to get down, okay? You want to get down? Hi. Hi. Well, um, I guess Bowie wanted to say hi to everybody, but I'm going to put him down. Wow, my ink really exploded in my hands. Yeah, I've been writing a lot. All right, Bowie. Honey, you're not going to climb on my back. Get down. Get down, sweet boy. Good boy. All right, guys, enough with the... All right, but I'm glad Bowie showed up because we got to have some kind of good vibes here because this is not a good vibe story at all. Um, in fact, there may be more people that have never been discovered, okay? So sit tight. Again, it's a trigger warning. Um, but yes, the story uh, came from Joseph Pesavento because he recommended a Paramount series. Let me know if you've seen it. It's very good. It's called Mayor of Kingstown, uh, starring Jeremy Renner. It is like a mix between uh, Breaking Bad, The Wire, Oz. It's a very hardcore show, just to let you know. So um, I'm on season three. And I have I had to take a break, <laughs> had to take a break, and I'm excited about season four. So um, when I was watching that, there is, as you guess, a riot breaks out in the series, and it is vicious and it is brutal. So that kind of got me thinking about riots. So I was like, there's got to be some riots that stick out, and I've researched a lot of riots. But this one, though, the Santa Fe, New Mexico, in February 1980, this one takes the cake, right? All right, guys, take a deep breath, and I'm going to talk about something that is extremely... It's it Actually, it sounds like a horror movie, straight up, uh, but according to the survivors, it's worse than a horror movie. So as I said, it's 36 hours of brutality, okay? And it has haunted... Uh, the survivors to this day. Now, trigger warning, like I said, and I want to be very honest in my research, okay? So if you cannot handle this horrific matter that I am talking about, please click out of my podcast. I hope you have a better mental health day. But if you are very curious about why this riot is the most bloodiest ever in American history, uh, of prisons. I mean, they said it's worse than Attica. Yeah. Then, uh, stick along with me. Uh, today, guys, I have made not tea. I just did, like, a little afternoon pick-me-up of some Nespresso coffee and some, uh, pumpkin, what is it, pumpkin almond milk? Mmm, so good. All right, I'm putting it back on the warmer. This was a riot 
that was so brutal that it I, it can't even be explained. Like, I, there, there are no words. So I'm going to do my best to describe what I can, okay? Now, the guards were rescued. There were people that survived this riot, and they were the guards. But they still have nightmares to this day. Was this political? Was the mistreatment of the inmates so bad that men were literally turned into animals? Not literally, but like a lion going after a gazelle, not only to survive, but to actually rip and mut mutilate the flesh? Weeks before the attacks, there were inmates that actually were scared for their lives and tried to get help, um, tried to write to officials in Santa Fe, New Mexico, because there already been crazy amount of tension and racial, racial tension in the prison. The prison was created in 1956. And the prison actually started to be neglected by the 1970s. That time, there was a capacity of 900 inmates, uh, also including officials. And on the night of February 2nd, 1980, the prison actually had 1,157 men who had complained for actual years of their living situation, of how they're being treated. The inmates complained of overcrowding. Now, when I researched the overcrowding, oh my goodness, you guys, none of you guys would probably be happy. But not only they had like these bunk beds, it started off with like these beds going like um, the front uh, bed and then you put another bed beside the bed and then behind the bed. It was just kind of close. Then it turned into bunk beds. Then there were actual inmates sleeping on the ground. So when they were sleeping on the ground, there was a light, like a night light in, in, the, dormitor um, in the dormitory. And there's like 60, 70 inmates there. Yeah, that's scary. And the light kept going off. So due to first witness accounts, um, it would be complete darkness at night. So if someone needed to go to the restroom, which is not really a bathroom, they accidentally would like hit or kick someone's head. They don't mean it. They just literally don't know where they're walking. So, you know, the tension is growing really, really high in this prison. Um, and then when it turned complete darkness, you would hear just random prisoners just make noises. I'm guessing to be annoying. You hear random screams. Uh, you hear the sounds of having sex, um, rape, you know, just not, not, not good. All right. So that's been happening for years, the overcrowding and the inmates, uh, allegedly, I don't think it's allegedly, honestly, if, if there's so much, um, evidence about this, but they were actually being served rotten food. So these inmates were considered, I feel like less than dirt, and this penitentiary had the worst criminals in it. Yes, yes it did. But sadly, it just seemed like they just threw whatever criminal like was around in this prison. Cause you even had uh, non-violent offenders in this prison. And this is something that is really looked down upon. But again, with the low staffing, the budget cuts, and just the, you know, disregard for morale at all, it came to a boiling point, like an absolute boiling point. February 2nd, 1980. It was brutally cold, freezing outside. There was snow on the ground. And as I said before, the prison was extremely understaffed. And when I say understaffed, I also mean that the turnover was like over 80%. So a lot of these guards were still green. They were not still properly trained yet, but yet they're around all these um, inmates. And these inmates are very close quarters together. Now, inmates in dormitory E2, it seemed, you know, they seemed to be sleeping, okay? 
So when the three guards entered the room to like, you know, do the bed check and check if everything's okay, these inmates snuck out um, a thing of, I mean, <sighs> prison has different names for it, um, but it's kind of like an alcoholic beverage that you make in prison. You steal a bunch of sugar, salt, and yeast, and then I guess you let it sit for long periods of time and it creates alcohol. So these inmates uh, were like, it's it's really sad because apparently the it smelled like a brewery. Like that's how much alcohol was around. So we don't know why the guards didn't take it away or we don't know if the guards just didn't comprehend, you know? Because like I said, they were all new. Like they all just started a job and they were extremely underpaid. Like ridiculously underpaid. I read like 9,000, 10,000 a year. This is 1980. So um, you're working long hours and you just started and you're in really horrible conditions where there's also corruption between the guards because there were inmates that actually would write to, like I said, government officials, whoever would listen to help them because they felt like they were in danger and the guards didn't even care. I know. So these um, guys or these inmates are so-called sleeping, but they're drunk off this brew that they made in prison. And out of nowhere, these inmates overpower these three guards, absolutely overpower the guards. They start knocking them down, beating them up, and then stripping their clothes off, grabs a belt and starts uh, wrapping... Uh, the belt around their necks and then the inmates start dragging these guards around. Yeah. Then they actually took their keys and started unlocking doors. Moments later, chaos and brutality was absolutely unleashed. If you thought it was brutal with the beatings of the guards, you guys haven't heard nothing yet. All right. So moments later, like I said, Horrible things happened. Um, there were tortures. There were raped. 33 inmates actually died horrible, gruesome deaths. Like, you can't even make it up in a horror movie. I will talk about a few of them, uh, but if you want to look at more, I'm going to link videos uh, in the bottom below. And I want to say that no one has ever been prosecuted for these deaths. So I feel that I need to tell this story. I hope you guys understand that. Okay. So there were million dollars in property damage. Yeah, like up to a hundred million dollars. I mean, it was like anarchy there. Like it is a huge, huge penitentiary. Okay. And all of a sudden it just became pandemonium. Over 400 inmates were injured. Yeah, 33 inmates, like I said, gone. They died. And then, but the guards were still alive when they were doing the hostage uh, situation. But the guards, I mean, honestly, what they saw and what they went through, I don't know if I would want to be alive. I'm being honest. Like, it's really, really sad. Um, they are still scarred. To after what they witnessed, even after over 40 years later. I know, it's all I'm gonna take you years before. So years before the riot, there was an inmate, Dwight Dur uh, Duran, like Duran Duran or Doran, not sure. But in 1977, filed a lawsuit against the prison. He was an inmate, but he claimed that his constitutional rights were violated. He went through cruel and unusual punishment. He actually claimed the lack of space, you know, the overcrowding, and the absolute understaffing. Like, and the guards, there were many guards that were corrupt. Not going to say all of them, guys. I'm not, because we don't know, but there were corrupt guards. I mean, I believe it, okay? 
Uh, there were drugs going on in the prison. I believe that's how the inmates were making their money because they were not even making money during the programs. They're supposed to be vo uh, vocational programs uh, for the prisoners um, and like education. But like because of the funding being cut, like that was only like two hours a day. So the inmates had to like fend for themselves. So again, overcrowding, tensions are high. Just a clear cocktail of what happened. Now, when the three guards were taken, I'm going to take you back to that night, Feb February 2nd. So when they were pulling the guards with the belt, with them still, you know, with their, with the neck still, um, you know, there, like, oh, sorry, I get uncomfortable, you guys, forgive me. So when the belts were wrapped around their necks and they were dragging, okay, um, they did fight, but then they were subdued by the inmates, so they stopped fighting. Now, as they're being dragged, they were being dragged to the observation window, and they grabbed the fire extinguisher off the wall and just started breaking down the glass. After that happened, the inmates broke into the control room and the guards is seeing what is happening. They're trying, they, they're, they don't know what exactly to do. It, it's too fast. It's too late. They can't even grab the gas container of tear gas to subdue the inmates. It's just no time because these inmates, they're, they're coming in and they're coming in strong and they're coming in fast. So these inmates that took over, they actually were the most violent, despicable inmates. Yes, I was like, damn, that really, why were they all in the same room? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, they definitely were planning this. But they broke into the control room in about three to five minutes. Um, and one of the guards was beaten so bad that the guards in the control room couldn't even recognize him anymore. So in 22 minutes, that's all it took, guys. The inmates, they gained control of the whole entire prison. 22 minutes. Yeah. And it was like hell, like absolute hell. Hundreds of inmates were actually smashing radiators, smashing toilets, sinks, setting fire to all kinds of documents and files and lighting furniture on fire, mattresses. And there were prisoners that were so, so terrified of this riot that they did not want any harm and they did not want to have any harm on them. So they would band together. There was like 80, 90 of them. So they like ran outside or they just went to their race or they went to an alliance and they stayed together so they wouldn't get, uh, you know, I mean, guys, these three men, they made like these death squads, okay? And they were gangs of inmates and they started making weapons. They started getting chair legs and metal pipes and they wore bandanas to cover their face. Remember, it's all, it's all smoke because there's fire everywhere. So people can't breathe at all. The prison became a disaster area where there was absolute, like, sewage water all over. There were paper and there was blood-soaked walls, floors, and it was just in many directions. Inmates broke into the medical center where they held all the prescription drugs and, you know, they were looking for drugs and they just started using it. Like, literally using the needles. They stole the food from the cafeteria. They took all the butcher knives and they, they took, they made all these weapons. Uh, they had a meat cleaver and I mean, it was just chaos guys. Like some, like if someone was just in the way or someone looked at someone wrong, they're going to die. Like you're going to get hurt. So there was this guy literally just freaking chopping people with the meat cleaver. Like, just get out of my way and just hurting people. Uh, there, are, there are people being uh, mutilated, uh, amputated, just like the worst stuff that you could think about. I mean, it's like war, 
but I feel like it's way more inhumane than war, which I know that's controversial to say, but war, you have guns and I don't know, I don't know a lot about war, but I feel like you die pretty fast, sometimes horrifically with bombs, but I don't know, man, getting a meat cleaver to the face or having someone just try to chop off my body parts while I'm trying to run away, that is terrifying. That is like Leatherface, like crazy, scary, terrifying. So these three men, like I said, started these death squads, which were basically like AB, which is the Aryan Brotherhood. I know, just full of hate gangs. Um, I saw one was called Muslims. Then you had the Hispanics, you know, like the, the actual like Latino gangs. So they kind of grouped up. And whatever person was close by or, you know, close proximity. But again, guys, you still have a lot of inmates that just want murder and mayhem because they're in there for life. So they're ready to just um, let, let off steam, I guess. I, I do not know. So warning, guys, I'm going to be talking about the first witness accounts. So if you are ready... Here I go. The death squad that was, you know, uh, created by these three men, the first place they wanted to go was cell block three. Now, the cell block three is where they went to settle scores with alleged snitches and child molesters that were in protective custody. The rooms were absolutely filled with the sounds of torturous screams and you could smell the flesh and blood. One inmate used a razor and a towel to tear off an alleged snitch head loose. Yeah, afterwards, when he took off the head, uh, he placed it on a broomstick and the inmate started to actually masturbate with his other hand while actually holding the broomstick with the head and walking around the prison. This horrible act with the beheading happened in front of these beaten guards. Yeah, they saw some horrific, horrific, uh, horrific images that I would never wish on anybody. The inmates, actually, there were ones that were kept alive and they were forced to smell salt. I didn't know salt kept you alert. That, that's something new. Um, they were being castrated while they were alive and the genitals were actually shoved in their mouths. One was actually shot point blank from a tear gas canister crushing his skull. One in one guard, this poor guard, he survived. But guys, this is like one of the inmates actually saved this guard's life because this guard was a young kid. He was young and he was known to be nice to the inmates. So the inmates actually saved him until he was killed. So the guard was allegedly... Uh, raped by inmates and then he was hung by his arms up in the air and when his arms were up in the air and he was held back because he literally could not fight back he could not defend himself they have his hands and one inmate got a knife and started cutting between his fingers and started cutting between his toes and cutting places that would not kill you I know what the f yeah, the guard survived, though. He did. He survived. After being like a pincushion for God knows how long. But he was saved by a few inmates that saw it and, and helped him. There was one inmate that was in his cell singing Take It to the Limit while his executioners were actually cutting through his cell bars. Now, when they got inside the cell, because I'm guessing he was thinking, nah, nanny boo boo, you can't get me. And he's singing, take it to the limit, you know? I don't know, maybe he was just mentally ill.
But when they finally got inside, they beat him and they dragged him into the gangway and they started cutting his flesh using a blowtorch. Yeah. I only have a couple, couple more, guys. There's so much more horrificness that happened. Like I said, guys, there's 33 deaths and I'm not going to explain all 33 of them. I mean, personally, I don't know all 33, but I'm kind of giving you the gist of how chaotic and disgusting it was. December 13th, 1979, a mother wrote the governor about her son's situation in prison. He was brought into population, and a few days later, he was raped by seven men. Nothing was done about it. They moved her injured son into cell block four for protection. And she claimed that she wrote to the governor that her son's life was still in danger because there were some inmates calling him a rat and other threatening names. And her son was in there because of a shoplifting charge. You want to know what happened to him? What happened to her son, who literally was in there for shoplifting, you guys? Okay? He was absolutely tortured until death. He was castrated. Um, forced to eat his genitals. Sliced by the throat. And then he was hanging in the prison. And they were screaming, die, you effing snitch. I don't think her son was a snitch. I mean, for all intensive purposes. I mean, yeah. But this young kid went to prison for shoplifting. He was young. He did, he did something stupid and got caught. But then he ended up in like one of the worst prisons ever. And he was only there a few days and he gets jumped by seven men. He is absolutely hurt. Nobody will help him. And his mother is just trying to get him out. And then what? The next week, the riot happens and she hears how her son dies. I just, I can't imagine. I can't. And I am so, so sorry that happened to you. And that makes me think he's probably not the only one. These inmates did have loved ones. There were families, neighbors, friends waiting outside of the prison during this cold, brutal night, wanting to know where are their loved ones. You got to think about that. Yeah. A prison psychologist, Dr. Mark Orner, overheard about the prison takeover weeks beforehand, and other guards heard about this riot and this overcoming, you know, just like taking over the prison again. But their complaints landed on deaf ears. Nobody did anything about it. They did a shakedown uh, and they searched through this, you know, like they swept the cells, but they didn't find anything. And they just, I guess, didn't take it seriously. During the riot, they are... What accumulated was 240 policemen. The National Guard was called. So if you want to say shootout, when you bring the National Guard, that's above SWAT. So they just like went to SWAT and then went right to the National Guard and just started shooting. There were 1,136 prisoners, including eight women. While the riot was ongoing, like I said, inmates that did not want violence, they saw what was going on, and they were screaming, asking for stretchers and masks. And everyone's like, why do you need masks? That's because the smell was so bad, and the smoke, you can't even, like, breathe. They were screaming that they had hosti hostages in cell block three that were injured, but they were still alive. They said that the guards were not hurt too seriously, but yet they were still alive. Oh, okay. 
The guards that are named that I found was David Ortega. Oh, I'm trying so hard not to butcher names, guys. Gutierrez and Larry Montoya. Also, the police chief, Jesus Sosa, said that there were 11 to 15 guards being held hostage. Officials contacted the inmates and actually said, listen, it is freezing outside. There's going to be helicopters flying in the recreational yard, dropping down blankets and jackets so you don't freeze to death. Inmate named Chopper One was heard over the walkie-talkie talking about how he was fed up with the negotiations and he just wanted to talk to the news. 80% of the prison population uh, were Hispanic. 20% uh, was divided into black and white men. 2015, there was an article about this horrific time in history. And it is about one of the surviving guards named Lawrence Lacero. Now, if you guys were wondering what the inmates' demands were, they were actually kind of straightforward. They wanted federal officials brought to the prison to ensure no inmates would be retaliated against in the aftermath of the revolt. They wanted prisoners reclassified, so first-timers with short sentences were no longer housed side-by-side -side with violent lifers. They wanted an end to overcrowding and harassment by the guards. And they wanted better food, better educational and recreational facilities, and a new disciplinary, that's a hard word, disin... That's one of the words, you know what I mean, guys. Discipline, disciplinary, why can I, I cannot say it. Committee. Okay, so basically... Um, that's pretty much very fair. Honestly, uh, they, they should be given that anyway. I mean, that should have been, I feel like if you're human, that's what should be offered. But hour and hour, um, hour after hour, there was no progress made. Uh, they started to release hostages slowly and inmates were able to flee the prison, provided officials with first-hand accounts of a massacre unfolding inside. Now, the knowledge of inmates being killed did not change the negotiation process, uh, Bigaman later wrote. I'm guessing Bigaman was the official. I don't know. I just think they just did this completely wrong. Um, the guards... Yes, they're alive, but my God, they were like beaten, they were stabbed, they were sodomized, and they barely clung to life. And their family members were waiting outside wanting to know if they're okay. And I, like I said, I will put the video in the, the description below, but one of the guards was absolutely terrified of sharp objects that... After he left and was with his family, he no longer could be around even forks. His family had to eat with spoons. The PTSD has been messing them up for a very, very long time. Um, it just seemed like New Mexico didn't do anything about it. I mean, even late night television, you guys, they said that nobody died. But it was inmates that died, even the ones that were very short sentences, like you mess up one time and you're in prison. I cannot believe they put him in with those hard lifers because psychos, total psycho. Not one of the articles. He was featured in an article, guys, 2015. My God, can I spit it out? I'm sorry. So... New Mexico lawmakers, okay, 2015, and this happened in 1980, please remember that. They were considering comp compensation for the correctional officers that are, were still alive and suffer from extreme PTSD. Lucero was nearly 60 years old in 2015. So when this riot went down, he was only 25 years old. He claims that he still remembers everything. 
Uh, he has nightmares of inmates coming to attack him, and he cannot forget the smell of burning flesh. Yeah, so now you're finally doing something. And guys, I'm going to say something that I feel like, I don't know, I feel like it's totally awful. This story is, is totally awful. Okay. They now, to this day, the prison is open in New Mexico, Santa Fe. And I was talking about the story with George and George asked me, would I, would I go on tour? Yes, guys, they've made a tour of this horrific event in Santa Fe, New Mexico. They are profiting off of people's horrific deaths. Now, that is a huge, like, that is something that is, um, I, I can see the awareness of it. I can. But I don't agree with, like, having some kind of an electric chair and people can sit on it and take pictures because it's funny. I don't think that's funny. Um... The blood and everything has been washed away, but apparently there's still hatchet marks in the building where people take pictures of. Now, remember I told you about that inmate who had, like, the blowtorch in his eyes and his head exploded? Um, the scorching marks from that incident is still there in that, in that building, in that prison. The prison is closed, okay? Um, it closed in the 90s. I believe it was 1998. But in 2012, they started pro profiting. Now, the survivors do not agree. They think it's awful that people are profiting. If anything, guys, I would give them the money to the survivors. That's what I would do with the money, okay? And I'm researching and looking, and that does not happen. And the 2015 article, um, you know with the surviving Lacero officer who actually saw so many horrific things that haunt him. Like, he says horror movies are nothing as well. Um, I don't think he's happy about it. His family said uh, that he is not the same. I, I believe it. I mean, I believe all the surviving guards... <sighs> Man, this is, like, tough to say. I mean, maybe they shouldn't have survived. I know we want our loved ones back, but these guys, they were killed in that riot. Even though they came back alive, they were no longer human beings anymore. They spent the rest of their lives scared, having nightmares, thinking that somebody was out to get them. And these were young people. These guards, like, were green and they would never in a million years imagine the brutality that was happening. So all these horrible murders that were happening in front, they did them right in front of the guards. And they would taunt them saying, who's next? Who's next? And I, I just, I, I can't imagine, like, not only you see someone like be beheaded and their head just on a, oh my God, it's, it's friggin' awful. The prison has been uh, known to, I don't know, Hollywood. I mean, I do know, sorry. Uh, Hollywood used the prison for the movie Zero Dark Thirty. Explains the weird vibes in that movie. It was a dark movie anyway, but weird vibes. And they also used the movie All the Pretty Horses. Yeah, they rented it like $1,000 a day to do movies there. Uh, but what do you guys think? I just think... <sighs> When, when it happened, it's like no one gave a crap, like, at all. Like, they kind of gave a crap, but then they, like, put it under wraps, and they didn't even give justice to the absolute murdered people. And you're going to be like, Katie, they were, okay, they were convicts. Who cares? They were evil people. Debatable. Like, as soon as I read about that kid that just shoplifted, which I don't even know what he shoplifted. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> but that is not enough for you to be gang, like, gang whore. I don't want, I can't even, like, say it. It's so fucked up. <sighs> Sorry. <sighs> I get upset. Definitely upsetting. 
So yes, this is the story, guys. This is just a little bit of the story. Um, I appreciate you listening. Let me know what you think about Tea Time, Dark Times with Katie. Is that something that you guys want to hear again? Or do you guys just want me to stick to true crime? Um, but there are souls out there that are lost and I send them loving energy because I believe there's good and bad and all kinds of things. There is a book out and I'll have it listed in the description below. Uh, it will give you nightmares. Um, I will give you the link for the 150 page PDF file. Yeah, there's a lot on this, but again, it wasn't really talked about in the mainstream media. The survivors were celebrated a little bit, but the survivors was, were still pissed off. They never really got compensated. And, you know, and there was actual prisoners that did, like, killings during that riot and bragged about it, like, on interviews. But they never were convicted because there was no evidence. So you literally had walking rapists and people that survived the riot saw horrific things and they're just like walking around. I mean, now they're older because this happened in 1980, okay? But yeah. Thank you guys uh, very much for being here. Please know that you are loved and you are cherished. And remember, you are doing better than you think. If you want, guys, you can check out my last story. It is about Burger Chef, not Burger Chief. And it is about the unsolved murders of four young kids that worked at Burger Chef. Definitely check that out. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Before I go, you guys, sorry, I almost forgot about the shout-outs. Oh, my goodness. So this, this week, this shout-out... It's going to be very controversial, so you can or cannot support them. But I recently met a young woman who actually goes to the prison. And she talks to the felons and she talks to the inmates. And they still have families that love him and daughters, sons, and what have you. So she gave me a website of these men, these people who are incarcerated that they create things uh, apparently they create leather goods purses all kinds of art so I will link the description uh, below you can make your decision if you want to support that or not but I just wanted to leave it up there I thought it was a really good time to talk about this shout out I felt like it's very relevant to this case um, but as always thanks guys appreciate you